Hello, students, and welcome back to our lectures on microbiology. Today, we're going to be discussing protists. Uh, now, we just finished discussing bacteria and important bacterial phyla. Um, in this next unit, uh, chapter five in your textbook deals with protists. And uh, as well, in fact, actually, chapter five in your textbook deals with all of the eukaryotic organisms, uh, and that includes um, the protists, the fungi, the yeast, and the helminths. Uh, I think it's a little bit, the, I think the chapter does not actually contain enough information. Uh, protists is, deserves, its entire, it deserves a chapter all by itself. Fungi deserve a chapter all by themselves. Helminths deserve a chapter all by themselves. So the fact that this particular textbook put them all into one chapter and didn't deal with them in great enough detail is a, is a small problem, uh, but we can get around that. So what, I, what I'm saying is that this lecture will contain more detail than the chapter. So I would not pay attention to the chapter. I would pay more attention to the lecture and the, the, the lecture and the slides from the lecture. Okay, so um, the other thing that, that's interesting about this course is that this is a second year course and in, in universities and colleges, when you take first and second year courses, they are usually what are called survey courses. So a survey course means that you, you are introduced to a broad range of subjects within a particular field but you don't go into any great amount of detail for any one of those subjects. They expect that you will do that later. Right. So, for example, if you went to college or you went to university with the intention of uh, studying uh, history, studying Italian history, for example, right? So, in first year, you would probably, uh, in first year, you would probably go into a survey course, and they would say introduction. The course would be, would be called Introduction to European History, and you would spend one, you would spend one week discussing the history of England and they'd say, oh, you know, here we have the Magna Carta, here we have the royal family, here we have this and the colonial period and the and the, the, the nautical period and so on and so forth. And then, okay, that's enough for England. And then the next week we go, we discuss France for a week and we say, okay, there's there's Jean-Paul Sartre, there's, there's uh, you know, uh, there's Napoleon Bonaparte, there's uh, there's Blaise Pascal and then that's enough of France. And then, then we spend a week discussing Italy and you think to yourself, well, I, this, none of this is very satisfying because Obviously, every one of these countries has a long, rich history, and we're only spending a week on each one. It, it seems kind of disjointed. It seems a very disjointed way to learn, and you're right, but that's the way that we get introduced to these subjects. So when you, in Columbia College, you spent first year learning that there is, learning a little bit about botany, a little bit about medicine, a little bit, bit about pathology, a little bit about cell biology, a little bit about molecular biology, a little bit about microbiology. And then in second year, you focus in on one of those subjects, microbiology, and we divide it up into smaller topics yet again. But each one of those topics, uh, the second year course in microbiology is still, a is still a survey course so that we only get to discuss very complicated subjects for a week or something like that. So that's what we're doing here. Uh, in fact, there are people who not only devote their whole careers to studying protists, but there are people who devote their entire career just to studying one particular protist. So if I do, if I do one two-hour lecture on protists, I'm not really doing the subject any justice. I'm simply giving you an introduction. It's a very broad but very shallow introduction to the field of protistology or protists. Uh, and I apologize for that, but in fact, studying protists is actually very interesting. Uh, it, many people study protists from an ecology point of view. You know, how many, uh, what types do we find? Where do you find them? What are they doing? How are they related to humans and our evolution? And other people are studying protists from the point of view of clinical medicine because a lot of protists, uh, a few of them make us sick and plague us with, uh, you know, diseases. And so those people are in a branch of medicine called, that has been formally called tropical medicine. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as parasitology because protists are one of the things that are classified as parasites, or traditionally some of them have been classified as parasites. And so the, so some, of the, some people study what's known as parasitology. And usually parasitology refers to the study of protists and 
uh, helminths that, that make us ill, but not bacteria, because if you study bacteria, it, that's bacteriology. And, and uh, diseases that are caused by fungus are, caused, are called mycoses. And so when you study fungi or fungi that make us sick, that's called mycology. Right. So here we have uh, parasitology that's referring to the helminths and the protists. I'm now going to introduce you to some of the important protists as far as microbiology is concerned. But it is, it seems like a lot of information and we're moving from place to place very quickly and saying, well, how are all these things related? Well, really the only way that they're related is that they're all protists and we, we uh, microbiology or protistology is a branch of microbiology and we're here to get an introduction to microbiology. Okay, so let's learn a little bit about protists. Okay, so as I said, the chapter five in the textbook actually deals with five different types of eukaryotes. It, chapter, chapter four is about prokaryotes, chapter five is about eukaryotes, and the eukaryotes that fall under the umbrella of microbiology are protists, helminths, fungi, algae, and lichens. And today we're just going to discuss the protists. All right, now here's an interesting thing about biology, about the history of biology as a science. Um, when I was a student, when I was your age, we went into the classroom and the teacher taught us that, that there are, um, uh, there are two, uh, three different domains. The same, you know, when we discussed phylogeny, they said there are three different domains. There is the domain eukarya, the domain bacteria, and the domain archaea, the same three that, that we're teaching you these days, right? And then in between the domains, we have the kingdoms. And so there, they taught us that there is a kingdom animalia that includes the eukaryotic organisms that are, that are not photosynthetic, the animals. It includes the kingdom plantae, which is the plants that are photosynthetic. And there was a third kingdom within the domain eukarya that they used to teach us about, and it was called the domain monera. Monera means, the word monera means single. Right, so the, uh, not the domain monera, but the mon kingdom monera, uh, the monera kingdom. And that particular kingdom, that's where they collected and put together all of the protists because the protists are single-celled organisms, in single-celled organisms, or single-celled eukaryotes, rather. Bacteria, of course, are single-celled organisms as well. But protists are single-celled eukaryotes, and they're generally quite large and elaborate, and so they initially the biologists thought let's put them all together into their own kingdom and then within that kingdom we have a bunch of different phyla right so within the within the kingdom animalia we have a bunch of different phyla we have phylum chordata phylum arthropoda phylum uh, phylum phylum platyhelminth and so on and so forth so typically you have you go domain and then kingdom, and then phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. And then, obviously, in microbiology, we have subspecies. We have serotypes. Those are those are uh, a division even finer than species. We have serotypes and subtypes, or strains. Right. So serotype, sub subtype, or strain are all words that you use to describe subcategories of a species. Okay. Now. In about the late 1980s, early 1990s, once we started analyzing the genomes of these various microbes, the biologists discovered that it wasn't really right to put the protists into their own kingdom for a very interesting reason. And that's that the biologists now believe that everything, all of the more complicated life forms on Earth evolved from the protists. The protists didn't go off on their own and have a separate evolutionary history. In fact, the, the, all of the more complicated life forms on Earth, the animals and the plants, they evolved, they started out as protists and protists which got bigger and more complicated and became multicellular. And so they thought it's not, it's not right to put them in a separate category when in fact they are actually our ancestors. So what they did starting in around the 1990s and early 2000s is they, they, uh, removed, they uh, removed the kingdom monera and they took all of the protists and they inserted different groups of protists in between the domain eukarya and the animal and plant kingdom. So, you know, so we have, we, earlier on we said, okay, you've got domain, domain eukarya, and then the phyla. 
how are we going to put uh, then the kingdoms rather right so then how are we going to put something in between the kingdoms and the domains well to, to in order to accommodate the protists well they did they just inserted these groups that are called supergroups and subgroups right so that so the protists are the protists are divided into categories called supergroups and subgroups and then those subgroups evolved into the various phyla that we now know, you know, the phylum chordata, phylum, you know, phylum, uh, phylum uh, anthropoda, and so on. Okay, so uh, this is just a little bit of history of biology. The protists used to have their own group, they used to have their own kingdom called the kingdom monera. If you run into an old, old scientist around someplace, they may still talk about the kingdom monera. But in the last last few decades, biologists have decided that that's not the right place to put the protists. It's actually quite fascinating that to think that all of the modern life on Earth is the result of protists evolving into more complicated forms. So protists are considered to be the ancestors of humans. There's one of the supergroups that led to the uh, a subgroup and then a, and then a bunch of phyla with, within which the humans belong. Uh, so we'll talk about that. Okay, so these are the subgroups. Uh, sorry, these are the supergroups that we're going to discuss. All right, so the, the supergroup Excavata is one of the supergroups of protists. Another one is called the Chromalveolata. Right? The chrome alveolata includes a lot of the organisms that are present in the sea, the algae and the seaweeds and things evolved from a group of a supergroup of protists called the chrome alveolata. Then again, in the ocean, there's a, there is a whole group of ocean organisms that evolved from a protist supergroup called the rhizaria. Right? And then there's a protist supergroup called the archiplastida, and the, the red algaes and the green algaes and a number of seaweeds and the land plants, all of these wonderful plants that we have on the land, they all evolved from these protists, the Archiplastida. Right? And then there's another supergroup called the Amoebozoa, right? the Amoebozoa. And they gave rise to the Basically, the amoeba, amoeba is little things that microscopic, mic, uh, microscopic protists that crawl around rather than swimming around. They crawl around, they kind of roll around uh, using a form of, a special form of movement called amoeboid movement, which we'll discuss. And that group is actually, well, we'll discuss it later. So, so these are the main, these are the main five uh, supergroups that were inserted in between the domain eukarya and all of the uh, eukaryotic phyla. Okay, and then within each of these supergroups, you have certain subgroups. And so within the, so what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to do a survey course. We're going to sample some of these supergroups, and we're going to sample some member some of the important members within the subgroups. That, that are contained within these supergroups. So within the supergroup Excavata, we're going to learn about the Fornicata, we're going to learn about the Parabasalids, and we're going to learn about the Euglenozoans. These three subgroups of protists contain path pathogenic uh, protists that are, that are harmful to humans, uh, and we're going to learn about those, but they are all members of a supergroup, uh, a protist supergroup called Excavata. So the the and then so these are subgroups and we're going to learn one or two members from each of these subgroups and those are what you need to memorize but you also need to memorize so you need to memorize these individual protists but but unfortunately you also need to do a little bit of memorization memorize just well enough to be able to see on a multiple choice test recognize the names on a multiple choice test you have to know that these these individual organisms that we're studying belong to the fornicata or the parabasalids or the euglenozoans and then in turn you have to know that the euglenozoans the parabasalids and the fornicata are all members of the supergroup called the excavata okay so the example of the fornicata that we're going to learn is giardia lamblia you've already heard that name right the, the member of the parabasalids that we're going to learn about is called an individual member of the parabasalids su subgroup is going to be the uh, trichomonas, trichomonas vaginalis, which causes a sexually transmitted disease. 
Right? And a couple of the members of the Euglenozoans that we're going to learn, the, su the subgroup Euglenozoans, will be Trypanosoma brucei and a very close relative of Trypanosoma brucei called Trypanosoma cruzi. You've already learned about these names because you learned that they are the Trypanosoma cruzi and Trypanosoma brucei are the two uh, uh, are the two protists that do antigen class switching. So they are able to hide from the immune system by by deliberately varying the proteins that are on the outer surface. So we discussed these organisms when we discussed uh, uh, epidemiology and and microbial pathology. And there's another important member of the Euglenozoans called Lishmania donovani. In fact, the the species the the genus Lishmania has several members in it that are important because they make people sick. Uh, th there's some quite uh, nasty diseases around the world that are caused by the genus Lishmania. Okay, now within the, within the chrome alveolata, we're going to learn chrome alveolata again as a supergroup. We're going to learn three of the subgroups. One of them is called the dinoflagellates. The dinoflagellates are important because they produce toxic blooms, algal blooms. Okay, so when you, uh, when you hear on the news that there's been a red tide, all right, a red tide means you had a red algae that just re started reproducing like crazy, and then all of the shellfish eat one of the main things that that, that, that uh, shelled. Well, not shellfish, but clams and mussels and oysters will. Uh, they're filter feeders, and so they eat the algae. If the algae is poison, if you eat those clams and mussels and oysters, the poison will be in them, and then the poison will be in you because you ate it. Right, so. Uh, very often you, you hear news reports about a red tide, therefore don't eat the shellfish or the clams. The, 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 basically the, the shellfish like crabs and lobsters will eat the clams when they're dead and then you eat the crabs and lobsters and then you get poisoned because of the, all of this is due to, the, to toxic poisons that are produced by a type of algae called dinoflagellates. And so the one example that we're going to learn about is called Alexandrium monolatum. Right, Alexandria monolatum is an example of a poisonous toxic dinoflagellate that causes red tide poisoning. Right. And then we're, we'll also learn a couple of, and a couple other members. Um, the apicomplexans, right, we, the, is a is a subgroup of the uh, of the supergroup Chrome alveolata. We're going to learn two members of that group, that subgroup. They are Plasmodium vivax. You already know that that causes malaria, and Toxoplasma gondii. You already know that that is a that is a biological teratogen carried by house cats. Then, then next we're going to learn about, a, we're briefly going to discuss the ciliates. The ciliates are perfectly harmless. They don't hurt us. So they're perfectly harmless. They live in the salt water or the fresh water. And uh, you, know what a, you know what cilia are at this point. You know that cilia are used for swimming and so on. All right, so uh, the ciliates are covered in cilia. They, they use them for swimming. The most obvious example are various species of paramecium. Uh, and because they're so ubiquitous, ubiquitous meaning that they're everywhere, uh, people, ecology, e ecologists and ecological microbiologists like to study the, the diatoms, I'm sorry, the paramecium. Uh, so we will just mention them. And then finally, we'll mention the diatoms. The diatoms are one of the most common life forms in the ocean. When you go to a sandy beach, you know that the sand is made of silica, made primarily of silica. And you may or may not know that in the early days, they used to make glass by taking sand from the beach and just melting it in a, in a, in a hot furnace. Right? So they would take a, an iron bowl and they would put some, burn some coal underneath the bowl and then they would throw some beach sand in there. And when you heated it up hot enough, it would melt and then you can turn that into bottles and windows and things like that. That's the way they used to do it. So glass is made primarily out of silica and diatoms are made mostly out of silica, right? So the, the, most of the sand on the beach is actually the skeletons, these little crystals of silica are the skeletons of dead diatoms. So that if you think of all the sand that's on the beach, then there must be a lot of diatoms in the ocean, and there are. There certainly are lots of diatoms in the ocean. So we will discuss diatoms. Then we're going to discuss just briefly mention the fact that there are, there is a type of organism in the ocean called the rhizaria. Within the, within the supergroup Rhizaria, we're just going to mention the radiolarians. These are kind of radio, uh, 
microscopic organisms that have radial symmetry, they also are some of the ocean life that you would see if you looked under a microscope. The Archaeplastida, we're not going to talk about really because they border, they, they are they are what we call the red and the green algae. And they are the, the, the Archaeplastida are the ancestors of seaweed and seaweed are the ancestors of land plants. Right, so the, the plants, all of the plant life that we have on land now originally arose from the Archaeplastida. Okay, now the Amoebozoa. They kind of crawl and, or roll around. They don't swim. Right, so we're going to learn about something called, a class of organisms called slime molds. It's a kind of a simplistic sounding name, slime molds. And they are, these are interesting because the slime molds kind of represent uh, a borderline between single-celled organisms and multicellular organisms, right? So slime molds under certain conditions will form into a multicellular organism. Normally they will be individual amoebozoa, right, that are wandering around, amoeba. And then under certain circumstances, usually if they don't have enough to eat and they're starving, they will cluster together and form a, a big structure and they will actually form into a, they will form themselves into a little thing that looks like a slug. It looks like it's about a millimeter long or so that kind of wanders around like a slug. And it, that is actually a multicellular organism. And uh, so, in other words, the slime molds, they are single-celled under some conditions and multicellular under other conditions, and they can actually move around and they're not photosynthetic or anything. So these are kind of these slime molds are kind of interesting because they are the precursors to animals. Right? So the slime molds are interesting. We're going to learn two of them. We're going to learn about a type of slime mold called a cellular slime mold. That means the slime mold is made up of individual cells. And we'll learn one specific example of it called Dictostelium discoideum. The reason why we care about that one is because many biologists around the world have used Dictostelium discoideum for years, for, for decades, as a model organism. A model organism is something that you use to study humans, but you're studying a, a, more, a, a more simple model of humans. You know? So if you want to, for example, if you want to figure out how a, a, a Boeing 747 jet works, if you tried to take it, you could try to take it apart, but it would probably be too complicated. So instead, if you took apart a simpler model to see how it works, take apart a Learjet or a, or a, or a Piper Cub one propeller airplane, you can figure out how that, how that works more, more easily. That's what, but when biologists do that, we want to figure out how humans work. We do experiments on simpler organisms that are called model organisms. So Dictostelium discoideum is a cellular slime mold that is important simply because, not because it's per particularly important to the environment or anything like that. It doesn't make us sick, it's relatively harmless, but it is, inter it, it is important to learn that name because biologists do, there are lots of biologists who are doing research on that particular model organism. Okay, now another type of slime mold is called, is called a plasmodial slime mold, which means that you have all these amoeba wandering around and then when they come together they fuse together and they put all of their nuclei into a common collective cytoplasm so they don't have the the the, the plasmodial slime mold is not made of individual cells it's made of a, a mass a, a giant a massive giant single cell that uh, has multiple millions of nuclei in it but a, a common single cytoplasm Right, so the one example that we'll learn about is called Fuligoseptica. Fuligoseptica, you will sometimes see it on the forest floor of British Columbia. If you're walking around in a forest and you see dead leaves, sometimes you'll see this kind of bright yellow uh, foam sitting on top of a dead leaf or something like that. That's Fuligoseptica. Okay, then we'll look at the genus Entamoeba. Entamoeba histolytica is the example that we'll learn. And Entamoeba histolytica is important because it is a human pathogen. It gets into contaminated water, and if you drink the water, you get amoebic dysentery. Remember that this is the this these are the amoeba. These are amoebozoa, and so Entamoeba is classified as an amoeba. And if you drink it and you get dysentery, it is classified, it's called amoebic dysentery, amoebic dysentery. So you drank some water that was contaminated with amoeba histolytica, you got amoebic dysentery. Of course, dysentery is violent, bloody diarrhea that causes a lot of 
water loss and uh, it destroys the cells inside the intestine so there's some blood in with the diarrhea as well uh, as you learned in the uh, uh, in 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 the uh, assignment the internet research assignment uh, one of the one of the ways that you can stop somebody from dying of dysentery is simply to give them clean water to drink that has some salt salts in it uh, sodium chloride, potassium chloride, zinc, and a few other minerals and salts and things like that. And then somebody, people do not have to die of dysentery. Uh, you heard about that when you were, or you read about that when you were studying the, the effects of Vibrio cholera around the world. Okay, and then this one is a little more serious. Another genus that we're going to learn about is the genus Naegleria. Specifically, we're going to learn about the species Naegleria fowleri, which is, again, it lives in water, it lives in ponds. Uh, but if you go swimming, it will get in through your nose and possibly get up into your brain and cause encephalitis and kill you, perhaps. All right, so if you look around certain parts of the world, they have there's a nice pond that looks like it would be a great place to go swimming or to get drinking water, and there's a sign there that says no swimming and no drinking, right? And one of the reasons for that is not because the pond is contaminated by sewage necessarily, but in many places in the world, the water is contaminated by Nigleria fowleri, which is is also known as the brain eating, uh, the brain eating am amoeba because it gets in through your nose or through your ears, it gets into your brain and then it causes encephalitis, which is inflammation of the brain and then that could kill you. Okay, there are a few new terminology, some terminology that we have to learn about. Okay, so protistology is the study of protists, right? But not all of them are parasites. So protistolo protist, uh, protistologists are microbiologists who study both harmful or harmless uh, protists, including sea algae, sea algaes, and so on, diatoms, and things like that. Parasitology, as I said, is the common term that's used for people studying uh, parasitic protists and helminths. It excludes viruses and fungi because if you study viruses, you're a virologist. If you study bacteria, you're a bacteriolo bacteriologist. If you study a specific type of fungi, you're a mycologist. You're studying mycology. The study is called mycology. And so that leaves us with this term, which is kind of an umbrella term that refers to studying uh, dangerous, par uh, dangerous protists and dangerous helminths. And we are going to discuss helminths after this section. Okay, you already know the term zoonosis, uh, that or uh, the other alternative term is zoonotic infection. So make sure you know what that means. This is where infections that human that people get specifically from animals, pets, farm animals, eating animal products, and so on. All right. So now within this kind of tapestry of names and and specialties, we have parasitology and protistology, which is what we're talking about today. Okay, now many, if we're talking about parasitic protists, many protists don't live inside other organisms. They're perfectly happy to live in the ocean or the water all by themselves and they don't, they don't bother anybody, but there are some protists that live inside humans and other animals and we consider them to be parasites. Okay, so, so what, where do these parasites live? What types of animals do they live inside? Okay, so you've already been introduced, <clears throat> excuse me, You've been in introduced to the concept of a definitive host versus an intermediate host. Paris, uh, par sorry, protists are interesting because I shouldn't have used the word parasite here. I should just use the word protist because protists are very interesting. They exist in many different forms, right? Like humans, we exist in one form, basically. As soon as we're born, we're a baby, but we're essentially a human. And then the only difference between a baby and a fully grown adult is size, but all the organs are the same. The, the general body shape is the same. The body plan is the same. Protists are not like that, and neither are some of the helmets. Protists in particular, they start out, they're born looking one way, and then they kind of turn into another form, and then they turn into yet another form and they turn into another form. And only, generally, some of those forms that a protist can assume are asexual. They do not reproduce sexually. Whereas other forms that they may exist in are able to reproduce sexually. And, you know, asexual reproduction is usually just binary fission. We call it, we talked about that earlier. Binary fission is where 
uh, a microorganism simply splits in half and you have two daughter cells that are identical to the parent, right? So that's called binary fission and that's, that is considered to be asexual reproduction, reproduction without sex right now. Uh, protists are capable generally of doing asexual reproduction in some forms that they exist in versus sexual reproduction in other forms that they exist in. Now, if, it, if a, a protist is a parasitic protist that is living inside another human then you ha or a, another animal, then you have to ask whether it is that animal that it's living in is a definitive host or an intermediate host. In the definitive host, the protist can exist in all of these forms, including sexual reproduction. And so if you have that, uh, you know, if, if, if the host is capable of supporting the sexually reproductive phase of the protist, it is referred to as the definitive host. On the other hand, if, it, if, if this protist can live in some other animals, but not all of the forms, life forms are supported in that host, it's referred to as an intermediate host. So we, uh, we mentioned the fact that for Plasmodium vivax, do you remember which disease Plasmodium vivax causes? Plasmodium vivax causes malaria. We mentioned the fact that humans and monkeys are not the definitive host. They are an intermediate host, which means that if, the, if, uh, if, you're, if you're a human or a monkey is infected with Plasmodium vivax, the Plasmodium vivax is reproducing inside the human. In fact, it invades and reproduces inside the red blood cells and inside the liver. It's reproducing inside a human, but it is not reproducing sexually. It just does binary fission, and it does another, another form of asexual reproduction, which we're going to mention in a second. So that's why humans and monkeys are the intermediate host, not the primary, not the, not the definitive host, rather. Okay, so inside the mosquito, the mosquito is actually the definitive host for malaria. So within the mosquito, the malaria, the plasmodium vivax, is able to reproduce sexually and produce uh, new offspring that are genetically slightly different than either of the parents. Okay, and then we discussed that some, par uh, some protists are carried around by vectors, uh, the mosquito or other types of insects uh, or, or, or uh, arachnids. Right? And then we discussed the term reservoir when we were discussing uh, epidemiology and pathology. This is another place where you can find the microbe besides humans. There are zoonotic reservoirs, those are animals, and there are inanimate reservoirs like lakes and bodies of water and the soil. The soil is an excellent example of a non-living reservoir for a number of pathogenic microbes. Okay, now where do we find protists? Where do we find parasitology it has some terminology for different types of protists that we find in different places? All right, so we need to learn some of this terminology. All right, so plankton, the term plankton, which you've probably heard at some point, plankton are protists that live in the ocean and they are moved around by ocean currents, but they do not have the ability to swim. And if they do have the ability to swim, they don't have, they don't have the ability to swim very far, maybe a centimeter or so at the most, you know, a millimeter or two. Uh, so that is called plankton. And then planktonic movement is defined as things being moved around by ocean currents, not being moved around in large numbers by themselves, not, not moving around on their own power. So microscopic organisms being moved around by ocean currents is called planktonic movement, and plankton are protists that are moved around this way. Okay, as opposed to zooplankton, zooplankton are motile or mobile, Right, so zooplankton is a special type of uh, of the of the not opposed to, but uh, of the of the plankton. We, we we recognize two different types of plankton: zooplankton, which are motile, and but the, and they're usually not photosynthetic. Right, versus phytoplankton. Phytoplankton are photosynthetic plankton. Again, they're usually not motile. They're, they just carried around by ocean currents. Zooplankton are motile, but they are they can't swim very far. Okay, two other terms we need to know that you need to memorize, a heterotroph versus an autotroph. Okay, so a heterotroph, heterotroph you will have heard this in Biology 110, for example, a heterotroph, heterotroph is a, an organism that has to eat other organisms to live. It can't produce all of its own food, it has to get it by eating other living things. Humans, for example, are heter heterotrophs. 
An autotroph is a photosynthetic organism that does not have to eat other things to live. Sometimes they do, but rarely, but sometimes they do. But generally, uh, an autotroph is something that has the ability to uh, gather energy from sunlight, make its own, make uh, carbohydrates out of the carbon in the atmosphere, the car CO2 in the atmosphere. So that's a heterotroph versus an autotroph. Okay, now there are two types of protists. A holozoic protist eats large solid food particles versus a saprozoic protist eats small soluble food. It sucks on things. Saprozoic. Okay, so here's a classic example of a zooplankton. This is a little tiny shrimp, brine shrimp. Uh, it is not photosynthetic, obviously. It swims around and crawls around if it can grab a hold of something. And all of these organisms are phytoplankton. You can look at them, they're actually green in some cases, and the green is caused by the, uh, uh, the green is caused by chlorophyll inside the chloroplasts. So these are actually, uh, these are eukaryotes that contain chloroplasts, and you remember from our earlier discussion that the chloroplasts came from purple cyanobacteria and other types of bacteria that are photosynthetic. And I mentioned, also mentioned the fact that if you're interested in this kind of thing, if you're interested in phytoplankton, you can have a career in oil exploration because people who study ancient phytoplankton, uh, you know, where you, where you, if you, you have these drilling ships that go around and drill cores out of the ocean floor, and then they pull these cores up and they ask a microbiologist who specializes in, in, in plankton to look at them and they say, oh, well, this area is rich in phytoplankton on the ocean floor. Probably if you drill underneath, deep down under that floor, you'll probably find a, a reserve of oil. And so they ask, uh, that's, one of the, that's one of the few careers that you can have as a microbiologist where you make lots of money because that's a it's a very rare specialty. All right, now on, back to that subject about sexual versus asexual reproduction in protists. Um, I should mention the fact that sometimes uh, students ask me if, uh, so we mentioned the fact that, that Plasmodium vivax has a definitive host, that's the mosquito, and an intermediate host, that's humans or monkeys. The definitive host is where, you, where the organisms reproduce sexually. So that is actually how you define the definitive host. A definitive host is a host that can support all the different forms of that particular organism, all the different life forms. Okay, sometimes students ask me, what about Borrelia burgdorferi? It's carried by ticks. Uh, and we know that it's carried by ticks, it infects humans and deer mice. Who is the primary host and who is the intermediate, who is the definitive host and who is the intermediate host? And my answer is that there isn't a definitive or an intermediate host for Borrelia burgdorferi because it's a bacteria. And a bacteria never reproduces sexually except in the rare times that it does so by conjugation. Right. So, so uh, there is no definitive versus intermediate host for Borrelia burgdorferi, right? They're all considered to, the humans, the ticks, and the deer mice are all considered to be the primary host, I guess, or the definitive host. Uh, but there, that's only because Borrelia burgdorferi does not exist in multiple forms. It doesn't exist in an asexual versus a sexual form, but many pro protists do. Okay, so let's talk about terminology that we apply to the sexual versus the asexual forms of various protists. All right, now, this term schizogamy, schizogony, applies only to some specific groups of protozoa, and it refers to the asexual reproductive stage. All right, when a protist is practicing schizogony, asexual reproduction, it forms things called Schizonts. This is a multicellular kind of a structure that contains many nuclei, and this schizont can burst and form a whole bunch of asexual feeding, uh, uh, a life form that just wanders around feeding called a trophozoite. Right? So a trophozoite, a schizont, will burst and release a whole bunch of trophozoites which wander around feeding, but they do not wander around mating because they're not able to do that. So a trophozoite comes from a schizont, and it is an asexual type of, re it reproduces through asexual reproduction through binary fission and through schizogony.
Right. Now, if you have a whole bunch of, if it, it, the, the schizonts will typically form a cyst, and so there are some protists that practice something called encystment, right? Uh, encystment means that you form a cyst, and then when that cyst bursts open and releases a whole bunch of trophozoites, it's called excystment. Right. Right. So then, this sh uh, so a cyst is a shell, kind of a shell that contains a bunch of trophozoites or a bunch of schizonts, which are the precursors to trophozoites. Right. All right, a merozoite is also an asexual form of organism that's released from a schizont. Right. So schizogony refers to the asexual reproduction that some protists carry out. On the other hand, some protists or, or some protists can exist in either an asexual or a sexual form. The sexual form is called a gametocyte. Right. And so the gametocyte some are actually develop from trophozoites within the definitive host. So if you have a if you have a trophozoite uh, inside a human and then that human gets bitten by a mosquito and the mosquito sucks it out so it ends up in the mosquito, it's actually able to develop into a gametocyte and then the, if two the gametocytes are either male or female and then they can mate and when gametocytes, male and female gametocytes uh, mate come together, that's referred to as syngamy. syngamy. Right, so be familiar with the term syngamy versus cisogony. Cisogony is the asexual reproduction form of a protist, and syngamy is the practice of sexual reproduction inside the definitive host. This, these terms apply really only to the phylum apicomplex, not the phylum, I'm sorry, that's a terrible misprint. Uh, they, they, well, the phylum apicomplexa, which causes, which contains Plasmodium vivax malaria, for example. Okay, so looking at Plasmodium vivax, the Anopheles mosquito, not just any mosquito, but the Anopheles mosquito is the definitive host for Plasmodium vivax, and that means that they can under uh, the, the Plasmodium vivax can undergo syngamy within the mosquito. This is where you have fusion of the gametocytes, and then they end up producing oocytes in the salivary glands of the mosquito, and then those those oocytes are released into humans, and then they produce sporozytes inside. The, sporozytes are released into the humans. Right? Humans are only the intermediate host, so they can only produce schizonts, right? And then the schizonts release merozoites, which wander around feeding. Some of them turn into trophozoites. Some of the trophozoites turn into gametocytes, but they can only reproduce if they get into an Anopheles mosquito. Okay, so Plasmodium vivax, the definitive host is the Anopheles mosquito. The intermediate host is the human or the monkey, the, the vector is the Anopheles mosquito, and there is a non-human reservoir, and that's the monkeys. Right? And so they, they practice they practice schizogony in the humans and, and syngamy in the mosquito. So here we just, just a diagram showing that the malaria parasite Plasmodium vivax has two, has two different life cycles. There's one particular life cycle that only takes place in the mosquito, and that's what's shown here in the light color. And then there's another asexual life cycle that only takes place in the humans, the liver, the liver cells in particular, and the red blood cells. This is a map from the Center for Disease Control. You should visit the Center for Disease Control website sometime because we are, I am gonna be sending you to that website sometimes to look things up. So make sure you know how to navigate your way around that website. And it's just demonstrating that in the mosquito, you have the possibility of sexual reproduction. Right? So this is called the spor sporogonic cycle of the inside the mosquito. Don't worry about it. I won't. I will not ask you about that. At most, I might ask, you know, uh, Plasmodium vivax within which organism does it carry out syngamy versus uh, schizogony. And then we have the erythrocyte, uh, exoerythrocytic cycle. That just means that the schizonts are are forming inside red blood cells and then bursting, and then it, a ruptured schizont releases a whole bunch of a whole bunch of trophozoites to go around and feed. Occasionally, some of them mature into gametes. Right, so they're exoerythrocytic cycle, and then the erythrocytic cycle, and then back into the mosquito again.
All right. So remember that within the within the monkey and the human, we can only practice shizogony, and within the mosquito, Plasmodium vivax can practice syngamy, which is the mosquito is the is the definitive host for malaria. All right. So now. This, we, we discussed this before when we talked about epidemiology. This is a world map showing the distribution of monkeys. So this is, these are the parts of the world where you find monkeys. And these are the parts of the world where malaria is endemic. Endemic means it's just, part, it's just accepted that it's there. It's always there. And you may never get rid of it. And notice that the, that the map for the distribution of malaria overlaps the map for the distribution of monkeys perfectly because monkeys are the non-human reservoir. So even if you cure all the humans of malaria, you will not uh, get rid of the monkeys. And so humans can still be getting it from monkeys via the mosquito. Uh, nobody's really interested in going on a, on a genocide to try and kill all the monkeys in order to get rid of malaria. Uh, most people that have, most countries that have endemic malaria try to get rid of it by focusing on the mosquito, possibly because nobody feels pity for mosquitoes. They're not, they're not cute or anything. They're actually quite annoying. And so they spray a chemical called DTT onto the water where the mosquito larvae are developing. So Mosquitoes lay their larvae on water, on bodies of stagnant water. All right, so they're not going to they're not going to lay their eggs on they're not going to lay their eggs on a river or a waterfall because the eggs will just get carried away by the current and probably destroyed by the current. So they they lay their eggs on standing water, on stagnant water, and then they develop and the first stage of the insect the mosquito larva is an underwater swimming insect. That underwater swimming insect then develops wings and turns into a flying insect. So most people, most countries that have malaria try to kill the, as many of the mosquitoes as they can. And uh, you probably know just from your own adventures in life that if you're around a body of standing water in the summertime, you're going to be attacked by mosquitoes mercilessly. Uh, Canada is no exception. Canada has terrible mosquito problems in the summertime if you go to rural British Columbia, you go around the lakes, you'll be bitten by mosquitoes endlessly. But the the good news is that those mosquitoes do not carry malaria. So we, malaria is not endemic to British Columbia. So here we have people trying to control the spread of malaria by spraying DDT onto stagnant bodies of water, standing bodies of water. So it's supposed to kill on the, on the right here. We have the mosquito larva developing upside down under the surface of the water. They swim around for a few days and then they develop wings and they become flying insects. All right, some structural terminology that we need to become familiar with. The term plasma lamella, plasma lamella usually refers to the regular plasma membrane of, me of certain protists, and I'll show you which ones in a minute. The word pellicle refers to bands of protein that are found just underneath the plasma lamella, if we're talking about a, a protist that has a plasma lamella. Some organisms, particularly the amoeba, have something called an ectoplasm. An ectoplasm means that means the outer part of the plasma membrane of the cell, which is usually specialized for feeding. So it's kind of rough and sticky, and it is used to envelop usually bacteria. So amoeba, for instance, have an ectoplasm, and then that's the name of the outer part of the plasma membrane, and the inner part is called the endoplasm. Plasm, right? And the ectoplasm is used by the amoeba to kind of wrap around bacteria and pull them in and then digest them through endocytosis, basically phagocytosis, essentially. Okay, some, micro, some protists have something called a contractile vacuole, specifically the, uh, the paramecia that I told you about. They have a contractile vacuole. We'll discuss that. It's used to increase or decrease its buoyancy in the water. So it's used to go up or down in the water the same way a submarine uses ballast tanks. So the paramecia have that. Right? Some organisms, particularly the amoeba, have things that are called pseudopods. So pseudopods are projections, or like kind of like arms, where you form the outer plasma membrane, where you form the ectoplasm into kind of like arms to, to reach out and grab things and bring them back and then swallow them and eat them. Okay, some 
protists have a primitive mouth that's generally called a cytosto cytosome, and some have a primitive anus called a cytoproct, which means that they go around eating things with their cytosome. The food gets inside, it's broken down by lysosomes, and then the garbage gets sent out the other end of the cell through the cytoproct, but it certainly doesn't have a doesn't have a digestive system as we know it. It doesn't have an alimentary canal or anything like that. It doesn't have intestines or a stomach or anything like that. Okay, so here are some examples. Right, so here we have a paramecium. It is a it is a type of microorganism called a ciliate. So it, it, the outer surface of its body is completely covered with cilia, which it uses to swim. Right there's the cytostome. There's the mouth. I misspelled it on the earlier slide. Sorry, it does have a T. Cytostome. Right, and then here's the the primitive anus, the cytoproct. So it swallows things this way. They stay in here for a while, get digested and broken down, and then the waste products are sent out that way. Okay, here we have an amoeba. Right, amoeba is another one of the supergroups. And it has an ectoplasm and an endoplasm, and these are pseudopods, these things that are sticking out. Pseudo means fake or sort of, and then pods refers to feet or arms, right? So pseudopods, it's like it's sticking out fake legs to grab things. And here we have uh, here we have a, a, an organism called the euglena. Notice that the the euglena has a contractile vacuole, and so does the paramecium. So does the ciliate. Right. So the in both of these cases, the euglena and the paramecium both live in the water. And if they want to go high, if they want to go up to the surface of the water, they squeeze water out of the uh, the contractile vacuole to make it less buoyant, so it floats closer to the surface. And if it wants to go down in the water, if it wants to go to a deeper depth, it sucks some more water into the contractile vacuole so it sinks. That's, that's exactly how a submarine works. If it wants to go up and surface, it blows the water out of the ballast tanks. If it wants to go down, it lets water into the tank so it becomes heavy and sinks down into the water. Okay, let's discuss the different phyla of protists. Okay, so protists were originally reassigned from the kingdom Monera to supergroups that are placed in between the domains and the phyla. So here are the six supergroups that we're going to study: the excavata, the chromalveolata, the rhizaria, the apic, sorry, archaeplastida, the amoeba, and the epistaconta. Right, so the epistaconta is a group of protists that includes fungi and animals and the of course the animals includes the humans right so the opistaconta is the phylum sup is the protist supergroup that we now believe are, uh, uh, eventually evolved into animals including humans those are the opistaconta all right, so the supergroups are the excavata, chromalveolata, rhizaria, Ar archaeplastida, amoebozoa and opistaconta and then within them, we have subgroups, the fornicata, the parabasalids, and the euglenozoans, the diatoms, the dinoflagellates, and so on. And we're going to learn one or two examples of each of these. Okay, this diagram kind of illustrates where they all are. Okay, so starting with the excavata. So the excavata gave rise to the, the excavata is a supergroup that gave rise to the can be that basically divided up into the diplo uh, the diplomonads the parabasalids and the euglenozoans so we're going to learn one example from each of these subgroups the diplomads the parabasalids and the euglenozoans okay so starting with the subgroup the, sorry the supergroup excavata we have the fornicata the parabasalids and the euglenozoans we're going to learn one or two examples of each okay so Starting with the supergroup, the fornicata. By the way, I should mention that the term excavata, what does it mean when you excavate? When you excavate, it's a Latin word. It means you dig a trench, right? You dig a trench. Right? That's called excavation. And so all of these, uh, all of the uh, protists that are in the excavata have a kind of a groove carved into them that looks like somebody dug a trench in it. And that's where the name came from. So they call them the excavata. Okay, so the sub supergroup excavata, the subgroup fornicata, has it, it is characterized by an unusual nuclei. Call, it has two unequal nuclei. Right? So most of the organisms on Earth these days have one nuclei, but in the early days, 
nature hadn't quite decided what they wanted what it wanted to do yet and so there were some organisms that were evolved to have two nuclei some that have only one it turns out that having only one turned out to be enough and so they kind of prospered but the ones that have two nuclei are still around they're still around here and there right they have no mitochondria they form cysts and they have four flagella right so they typically have four flagella the example that we're going to learn about that you already know about is Giardia lamblia, which causes a disease called giardiasis, which causes diarrhea. Uh, Giardia lamblia is endemic to giardiasis, is endemic to British Columbia and many other parts of Canada. Anywhere that you find beavers, for example, beavers commonly carry giardiasis. So if you have uh, a lake that has beavers living in it, beavers, of course, are Canada's national an uh, animal. If you have a, a lake that has beavers in it, don't drink the water from that lake because you could get giardiasis, right? So Giard Giardia lamblia is a member of the subgroup Fornicata. Fornicata is a member of the supergroup Excavata. Okay, next, the supergroup, the Parabasalids, right? Again, they have no mitochondria. They do not have mitochondria. They have four flagella as well. And the example we're going to learn about is trico Trichomonas vaginalis. Right? And it causes a sexually transmitted disease called vaginal trichomoniasis. Right? Trichomonas vaginalis uh, causes vaginal trichomoniasis. Uh, this, I should say that vaginal trichomoniasis is much more difficult to get rid of than gonorrhea or syphilis because gonorrhea and syphilis are just bacterial infections that can be killed with antibiotics, whereas the, the uh, protists are more similar to humans and the trick to curing somebody of an infection is finding something that will just kill the microbe while not harming the human. It's very difficult to find chemicals that will kill just protists because as far as nature is concerned, protists are very, very similar to humans, right? Bacteria are quite different. Okay, so Trachomonas vaginalis, uh, if you get an infection of that, it's, it's kind of difficult to get rid of. All right, the euglenozoans, right, contain several interesting uh, species, including Trypanosoma brucei, which causes sleeping sickness, and it has a tsetse fly vector. It's endemic to certain parts of Africa. Uh, there's a closely related relative called tri uh, Trypanosoma brucei, which is endemic to Central America, and it has a what's called a kissing bug vector, and it does antigenic class switching in order to evade the immune system, and so it causes very long-term illnesses. And then there's another very important example called Lishmania donovani, and, and in fact, other members of the genus Lishmania causes, cause a disease called Lishmaniasis, right? and it has several other names that we'll discuss later, and it's carried by the sandfly, by a sandfly vector, and it, it does something that's even better than antigenic class switching. It does immune system suppression. Uh, immune system mollification, which we'll talk about later. But basically, Lishmania donovani gets into your body and it causes a number of problems. And when your immune system comes after it, you send, you know, these white blood cells come after it, ready to eat it. And these white blood cells suddenly make contact with the Lishmania, Lishmania donovani, and the Lishmania donovani mollify, mollifies them it pacifies them and says, don't worry about us. We're not the enemy. Go away and leave us alone. We're friendly. We're not hurting anybody. Don't worry about it. And this is, and the immune system does that. And so we don't quite understand how this happens. There are a lot of scientists who are working hard on, on how they do this. There's some interesting applications for this it, to biotechnology. Right? For example, these proteins that are on the surface of Lishmania donovani, uh, why couldn't you put them onto the surface of transplanted organs so that the organs wouldn't be rejected, right? So that's another avenue that people are working on. Okay, so Lishmania donovani and Trypanosoma brucei are both members of the subgroup, the euglenozoans, and then the euglenozoans are a, are a subgroup of the supergroup Excavata. Okay, let's talk about the subgroup Fornicata to begin with. Right, so they, they, they reproduce through asexual binary fission right they form cysts that can cysts that can get into the water when you drink it but also into food uh vegetable uh, vegetables and uh fruits that have not been properly washed before you eat them may have cysts from uh 
fornicata like Giardia lamblia. Right, so Giardia lamblia, giardiasis, is sometimes referred to as hiker's diarrhea. I probably will ask you that on multiple choice questions. Hiker's diarrhea is caused by Giardia lamblia. Uh, it happens when you drink water that's contaminated by animal feces, in particular beavers, for example. Right, so here's what it looks like. On the left, we have a scanning electron microscope image of Giardia lamblia on the inside of an animal's intestine. Right, so you have all of these, these Giardia lamblia that are stuck there. And then uh, in the middle, we have a scanning electron microscope image of the, the, uh, the ventral surface, the underside of the Giardia lamblia, which it uses to stick onto the inside of the intestine and feed. And notice, and on the right, we have a bright field microscope image, and that's, that's the only reason why you can see the two nuclei inside it. Uh, these things, when I had a professor once like 30 years ago, very interesting guy, specialized in uh, protists, and he said that these things always remind him of owls. They look kind of like owls hoot hooting at you from the tree or something like that. Uh, and notice, count the number of flagella. There are four flagella. Here's another. This is a false color scanning electron microscope image. These things are very small, maybe 50 micro, my, uh, microns from end to end. And they have a ventral, what's known as a ventral suck, uh, sucking disc, which is what they use to stick to the inside of the intestine and hang on inside of you. They have four flagella, which they use to swim when, they're, when they find themselves out in the water. So they get into your body through the oral fecal route. Uh, they get in because of beaver excrement in the water or uh, they, they were on vegetables or fruits or drinking water. This is a beaver lodge. Uh, this is a very exotic thing that, uh, it, that uh, we have in Canada where beavers live. Beavers are uh, considered to be uh, ecological architects or ecological engineers, I think is the term meaning that they change the landscape that they live in quite dramatically. So they go around and they chew the trees. They chew little tiny birch trees and things like that until they cut them off. So they're kind of like loggers chewing their way through trees. And once they've cut down these trees, they carry them back to the middle of the lake and they pile them up inside a big, inside a big pile. And they live inside that pile. The entrance to that pile is underwater, so only they can get to it because they can swim underwater, whereas the, the wolves and the, and, the, and the bears that are trying to eat them can't get under there. And so this is called a beaver lodge. So here are the beavers, here are the beavers inside. So the, on the right, bottom right, you see a beaver there cutting down a birch tree, and then it's going to it's going to take the birch tree back and l l put it on top of the beaver lodge. Um, and over on the left, that's something called a beaver dam, right? So they 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 actually build dam. You know, they're they're quite clever. We don't give them enough credit. So they actually have this clever scheme of building a house that their predators can't get into, and they also build a dam to to ensure that the water level in the lake that they're living in is high enough so that the other animals, you know, if the water level drops, then the other animals could crawl in there quite easily. Uh, so the, but nevertheless, they carry giardiasis a lot of the time. So you don't want to, if you see one of these things on a lake, you don't want to drink the water from that particular lake. All right, let's move on to the par subgroup, the parabasalids. The example we're going to learn about is called Trichomonas vaginalis. It causes vaginal trichomoniasis. It, it is a sexually transmitted disease, and it causes a feature in the woman who catches it called a strawberry cervix. The cervix is the little ring the cervix is the little ring of muscle that guards the entry to the uterus. It's the it's it's a little ring of muscle between, located between the vagina and the uterus. And if it becomes inflamed, it turns red. It's called a strawberry cervix, and that's a, a sign that you are infected with Trichomonas vaginalis. Okay, here's this is a pap smear, which is where they put a swab into the vagina and they take a sample of the skin tissue from the cervix, and then you can actually see the you can actually see the uh, Trichomonas vaginalis in this pap smear. Right, so the so and then over here on the left, you can see that we have four flagella, and the main distinguishing feature between Giardia lamblia and Trichomonas vaginalis is that the Trichomonas vaginalis has a, a fairly round body, so it's easily recognized. Okay, so it is a sexually transmitted disease. It divides through binary fission. It doesn't reproduce sexually. Ironic, because it's a sexually transmitted disease. 
Okay, now the excavata subgroup, the euglenozoans. Okay, so we have Trypanosoma brucei, which is, an, which is endemic to certain parts of Africa. It causes a disease called sleeping sickness. It is carried by a vector, an insect vector. The insect is called the tsetse fly. Right? And uh, it practices antigenic class switching to evade the immune system. It has a very closely re related cousin called Trypanosoma cruzae, which is uh, located, found in Central America. Uh, you know, Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador, those areas, Southern Mexico, uh, Northern Brazil even. Uh, and it is, again, it practices class switching. It's carried around by a vector, an insect vector called a kissing bug, common, commonly called a kissing bug. And then we have Lishmania donovani, uh, which causes a disease called Lishmaniasis, which is, causes lesions or blisters on the skin. It also causes uncontrolled swelling of certain parts of the body. Looks sort of similar to elephantiasis. Uh, it's carried by an insect vector called a sandfly. And it does immune system mollification. Mollification means to kind of say, don't worry about us. We're not dangerous. Just leave us alone. Okay, so starting with these two. So this is Trypanosoma. It's impossible to tell from looking at it whether this is Trypanosoma brucei or Trypanosoma cruzae. They both look the same. If you wanted to tell them apart, you would have to use serology. The simplest way would be either PCR or serology. Uh, but this is what the Trypanosomes look like. Uh, on the right, on the left, we have a bright field microscope image where you can clearly see that this, is, this has a single nuclei and it has kind of a, a, an internal flagellum that it uses to swim. These are red blood cells, by the way, these other things. And then over here on the right, we have a false color SEM image of uh, trypanosomes and white blood cells again. So what they do is they, they deliberately, they reproduce every two weeks and every, every new generation has a different set of proteins on its surface. So that about every two weeks, your immune system that's trying to kill them has to go back and start again. And as you know, it takes about it takes about two weeks for your your immune system to mount an immune response based on the humoral immune system. Uh, the humoral immune system is where you attack something with antibodies. Uh, unfortunately, our our white blood cells that that are capable of you, we talked on the when we discussed bacteria, we discussed the pyogenic bacteria like Staphylococcus aureus where the white blood cells are pre-programmed to attack it immediately, which is great. Uh, so the, 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 they attack it immediately and destroy it. The blood, white blood cells have no innate response to trypanosomes, so they don't. It's left to the, to the adaptive immune system, the humoral immune system, to kill them. And that takes about two weeks where the humoral immune system has to feel the proteins on the surface and then go and get a B cell that can differentiate into a bunch of plasma cells and produce antibodies that will attack it. That process takes about two weeks. And by the time the white blood cells have found, uh, created these plasma cells, the stupid trypanosome has changed its surface proteins. So it has to go back and start again. And so every new generation of trypanosomes that are reproducing in your blood cause an immune reaction which leads to a little bit of a fever. So one of the characteristics of, of uh, a trip trypanosoma infection is that you have a recurring fever. Every two weeks you have a bad fever and then it kind of goes away a little bit. Uh, the fever will disturb your sleep and hence the name sleeping sickness. Okay, so that's because we've, we've the antibodies you know, the, the different, we have a different clone or different clones of trypanosomes appearing every two weeks. Okay, so there we have the trypanosome. Trypanosoma brucei is endemic to certain parts of Africa. It causes sleeping sickness. Trypanosomiasis is the technical term. The common term is sleeping sickness. This is a tsetse fly. Notice that there's some excrement coming out of the back of the tsetse fly. The tsetse fly is bite. It, it's, it, it, uh, this disease enters through the parenteral root because the tsetse fly bites your skin and takes a chunk out of your skin, so it breaks the skin. And then the excrement from the tsetse fly gets into the break that the tsetse fly made in your skin, and that's how you get infected. So infection of Trypanosoma brucei is from the parenteral root, the parenteral root. Okay, these are the areas of the world where you find trypanosomiasis caused by trypanosoma brucei. 
Okay, now Trypanosoma cruzae is endemic to Central America, and it has an alternate name. It is uh, uh, it is trypanosomiasis, the same way sleeping sickness is. So both sleeping sickness and this are called trypanosomiasis, technically. But the common name for the version that you find in Africa is called sleeping sickness. The common name for the version that you find in Central America is called Chagas disease. Right, so Chagas disease, and you do need to remember that. And Chagas disease is carried, Trypanosoma cruzae is carried in Central America by this insect, which is called a kissing bug. There's a penny next to it, so you can see it's quite small. And it's called a kissing bug. It is a saprophyte insect. It it sucks blood out of you, out of you, and it likes to bite you on the face because if you're wearing clothes, it's too lazy to get under your clothes. So typically, if people are sleeping outside or if they if they have a house that's located in a kind of a jungle area, you will have these insects around. They'll get into your house or they'll get into your tent or into your sleeping bag and they'll bite you on the face as if they were kissing you goodnight or something, which is where they get their name from. And in the process of doing that, they may inject you with a little bit of Trypanosoma cruzae. Uh, we have these insects in, in, in British Columbia as well. You see them every now and then. Uh, but they don't care. They're not, they are not carrying Trypanosoma cruzae. So other than the fact that they might bite you on the face, there's nothing to worry about. Most of the ones that most of the kissing bugs that you see in British Columbia are saprophytes that suck the sap out of plants rather than suck the blood out of humans. Okay, so these are the areas where Chagas disease is endemic, Central America and South America. Lishmania donovani. Okay, so Lishmania donovani causes Lishmaniasis. Specifically, it causes a disease called visceral Lishmaniasis. Visceral Lishmaniasis, abbreviated VL. Right, so notice that they are monotrition. They are monotricious, although that term usually applies to bacteria. They have a single large flagellum. This is a bright field microscope image, so you can see they have a big single nucleus, so these are all individual cells. Right. Uh, this is just two of them close together. They banged into each other. They're not, they're not dividing as far as I know. And it causes lishmaniasis or vis visceral lishmaniasis. Now, I may ask you, what is the technical term for Kala Azar? or dum dum fever on a test. Dum dum fever and Kala Azar are alternate names for vis visceral Lishmaniasis, and the infective agent is called Lishmania donovani, which is spread by an insect vector called a sand fly. I'm gonna show you some slightly disturbing images of the lesions that they cause. Right, so this is a characteristic of dum dum fever or Kala Azar, visceral Lishmaniasis. So these are the areas in the world where Lishmaniasis is endemic. Right? Uh, British Columbia, Canada, we don't have to worry about it. Central America and South America, they do. Parts of Africa, parts of South Asia have to worry about it. Okay, so that's the end of our discussion there. Lishmaniasis, trypanosoma, and so on. We learned about, these are examples of the subgroup, uh, the supergroup excavata, and now we've learned specific examples from the subgroup fornicata, parabasalids, and, and euglenozoans. Okay, let's move on to the chrome alveolata. Okay, so subgroups of the chrome alveolata one of the subgroups is called the dinoflagellates. If you are a protistologist, you're very interested in these. Uh, some of them, most of them are neutral and harmless, but they are, they, they are a big constituent of the, of the organisms that are in the ocean. Uh, they are photosynthetic, right? So they are photosynthetic red algae, right? And they, they have a body that's made of cellulose, which is kind of interesting because normally cellulose is something you think of as plants being made out of cellulose. But the dinoflagellates are made of cellulose as well. They typically have two flagella. They reproduce sexually. They live in the ocean. And occasionally some of them make toxic blooms or red also known as red tides. So the example we're going to learn about is called Alexandrium monolatum. Okay, now, again, within the chrome al alveolata supergroup, we have the subgroup apicomplexans. They have, uh, they have a set of organelles at the apex of the cell. So the apex is the, considered to be the top part of the cell. And so they have a complex of organelles at the apex of the cell, so they're called apicomplexans. 
apicomplexans or apicomplexans, right? They do both schizogony and syngamy. And the two examples that you already know about are Plasmodium vivax and, and Toxoplasma gondii. Those two belong to the subgroup apicomplexans, which is a subgroup of the, of the supergroup Chromalveolata. The subgroup ciliates includes the paramecia that have their contractile vacuole and they live in the water and they swim by means of, of uh, cilia that are covering their entire surface. And then the diatoms are kind of interesting because they are a harmless ocean microbe, but they are, they're, they're a massive uh, constituent of the ocean. A, a large amount of the life in the ocean is comprised by diatoms. Okay, let's look at some of these. Okay, starting with the dinoflagellates. The dinoflagellates all have a groove in the middle and a flagella, one flagella coming out of the bottom and another flagella wrapped around the middle as if it were a belt or a sash, right? And so these are dinoflagellates and uh, you'll hear protistologists sometimes refer to them as dinos, dinos. Right? So I learned about protistology from a very distinguished professor at UBC named Max Taylor. I don't know if he's still alive or not, but he was one of the world's foremost experts on dinoflagellates, and he always used to call them dinos. I think they were his favorite organism. Okay, so they are red algae that sometimes causes toxic blooms. Alexandria monolatum, for example, is a dino, dinoflagellate that causes toxic blooms. A bloom is a sudden explosion in population of dinoflagellates, which are toxic, right? And so you'll hear the term algal bloom sometimes, an algal bloom. Here's what they look like. These are scanning electron microscope images. They're, they're quite pretty, quite elaborate, and they have a body made of cell, cellulose and a, a groove in the middle of some sort. And they are the cause of red tide poisoning. Okay, so occasionally you'll hear about a red tide on the news or something and a whole bunch of shellfish or mussels or clams will have to be recalled because if the people eat them, they will be badly poisoned. Uh, the interesting thing about dinoflagellates is that they produce some of the most potent poisons in the world, right? So we're, think we're used to thinking about snakes and spiders as being venomous and producing poisons. Those venoms are not nearly as lethal as the venoms that are produced by these dinoflagellates, by some of the dinoflagellates. All right, I will not ask you about this on a test. I like to you know, infuse my lectures with a little bit of historical, interesting historical anecdotes. My personal view is that it makes the subject more interesting if you hear about microbiology and how microbiology intersects with history. Uh, I hope you don't mind, uh, but I will, I will always make it a point to tell you when I'm not, I'm just telling you a, an amusing anecdote about something to do with microbiology but I will not test you on anything like this. This is just one of those things that you can tell your relatives that you, you know, they'll be amazed that you know this historical thing. Okay, so in, in, the, uh, in the 60s, world history in the 60s, there was something called the U2 incident in 1960. Right? And this is when the United States and the Soviet Union were mortal enemies and they were on the verge of nuclear war all the time and they wanted to, the United States and the Soviet Union, they wanted to keep the number of missiles they had secret. They still do, obviously. Um, but the other side would always try to find out how many missiles they had by looking. Uh, these days, they look with the use of spy satellites. But in 1960, they didn't have spy satellites. They used to use flyovers. They used to use high altitude spy planes, as they were called. And so, the United States had a very high altitude spy plane that was meant to fly at 100,000 feet or something like that. It flew very high up in the atmosphere and they would send these, the plane was called the U-2. Uh, it was a very secret plane and they used to send these spy missions flying from Turkey over the Soviet Union from Turkey to another, I think to Britain or something like that. And they would land and they would take photos as they were flying over and the, with a high definition camera, see where all the missiles are and that's how they would know where they are, right? And the, so the, the, the United States Central Intelligence Agency was doing this secretly. Officially, the United States government said, no, no, we're not, why would you suspect that we're sending spy planes over Russia? We would never do anything like that. And so these U-2 planes had no 
uh, markings or anything like that. They weren't marked as, U as American planes. And so every time they would fly over, the, Soviet, the Soviets would send up fighters to try and shoot them down, but they were flying too high. And one day they, they got lucky and they shot one of them down. And inside was an American pilot named Francis Gary Powers, this guy. And they took him and they put him on trial. And so they had a show trial that they put on television where he had to, basically he had to tell, confess that the United States was spying on the Soviet Union and that he was an American and that he was, he was a spy uh, for, for, for the CIA and so on. And the Soviet Union was trying to you know, make make themselves sound virtuous that they've they'd caught this American spy doing terrible things and look at all the terrible things the Americans are doing to us. We would never do anything like that to them. Of course, they were doing exactly the same sorts of things. But nevertheless, it was a big propaganda victory for the for the Soviets. Um, those of you who like old spy movies or John Larroquet spy novels and things like that, remember that when the Soviet Union was still there. Americans and Soviets used to swap spies. So if the Americans, if the Soviets caught an American spy and the Americans had a Soviet spy, they would swap them in 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 Berlin. There was a a, a bridge called a place called Checkpoint Charlie where where people would walk across a bridge, you know. And so the Americans would send the the, the Soviet spy across in one direction. And the Soviets would send the American spy in the other direction. And it's a very dramatic thing that you see in a lot of these old spy movies. So they traded Francis Gary Powers for a Russian spy. And so he came home. But the interesting thing was when the Russians caught Francis Gary Powers, he was carrying a souvenir silver dollar. And when the Russians got a hold of that silver dollar, they squeezed it and a needle came out and uh, they figured out that this was actually meant to be his suicide device. So that if he if he did not want to be captured alive, he would take that suicide device and squeeze it and stick it into his neck and it would kill him in a, in a few seconds. And it contained poison from Alexandria mon monolatum. So it's the, the poisons that are produced by these uh, diatoms are called saxitoxins, and they are the most potent poisons in, in the world. So if you, if you, if you had you know, a, a, mil, a milliliter of saxitoxin in a coin like this with a needle that comes out and you stick it into yourself, you'd be dead in five seconds painlessly, supposedly, but it's a, it's a very potent, effective poison. And so I, it was just interesting that, that these poisons are made by a, a protist that microbiologists are interested in, and it apparently spies are interested in the same poisons. Uh, CIA and KGB spies are interested in the same poisons. Um, there were some other, there were some other uh, incidents where Soviet spies poisoned other people with other poisons that came from uh, red tide poisoning uh, 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 diatoms as well, but we won't go into those one story is enough. So that was just an amusing historical an anecdote. Uh, I would never ask you about that. It's just something, just one of those places where microbiology intersects with world history in a kind of an amusing, entertaining way. Okay, let's just take a brief detour and look at the paramecia. So as we said before, they are covered in cilia. So this is a phase contrast microscope image on the left, and then here's a diagram on the right. So it has a it has a site, uh, uh, it has a you know a, 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 a cyto, cytoproct is the anus. I've forgotten the name for the mouth. The cytos, cytosol, I believe, right? And so so uh, cytostome rather, yeah. And so so you can see all of these things inside the paramecium are actually food vesicles, so it's been eating food through the cytoproct. All right, so here we have two examples of the apicomplexans, right? So the Plasmodium vivax and Toxoplasma gondii, you know all about those. Okay, so they have this complex of organelles and membranes at the apical surface, so these are called apicomplex, ap uh, ap apicomplexans. Plasmodium vivax has the definitive host, which is the Anopheles mosquito. Not a, no other type of mosquito will do. The secondary or the interme uh, intermediate host is the human or the monkey. The monkeys are an animal reservoir, a non-human reservoir. Okay, so this again is a CDC chart that I showed you before. And then Toxoplasma gondii.
you know that the definitive host for Toxoplasma gondii is the house cat. The, the intermediate host, I'm sorry, I have a nasty habit of saying secondary host instead of intermediate host. The technically correct term is intermediate host. Humans and other animals are intermediate hosts, particularly if they ingest cysts. Right, so uh, cat food and dog food, but particularly cat food, sometimes contains Toxoplasma gondii cysts that they didn't they they didn't get rid of when they made the cat food. So it's not uncommon for cats to have uh, cyst, uh, Toxoplasma gondii cysts in their feces. So a pregnant woman should never be cleaning out the cat litter box because. Uh, Toxoplasma gondi is a biological teratogen that causes birth defects in the unborn. It causes transplacental infections. We learned all about that term earlier. All right, so it, the cysts get into the meat, the meat gets into the cat food, gets into the cat excrement, and then it can cause birth defects in a developing baby, developing fetus or developing baby. All right, let's have a little discussion about the diatoms. The diatoms are quite cute. They are harmless. They have a body that's made of silicon, which is quite unusual. Uh, it's the only silicon-based life form on Earth. Right? It is made of two different parts, so it looks kind of like a shoe box or a box that has a lid. Right? A box that has a lid, you open it up and it's a, it has a loose fitting lid on the top. So the fact that it has two parts is the reason why they call it a diatom. The word atom means piece, right? so two pieces. And these are a very big part of the life in the ocean. Right? So not all of the life in the ocean is big, like fishes and fishes and whales and things like that. Most of it is actually small. If you look at all the, what's known as the biosphere, if you look at the biosphere in the ocean, most of it, by far the majority of it, is made of uh, protists like sea, uh, algae, uh, various types of uh, algae, uh, diatoms, dinoflagellates. All of those things by far outnumber, just in terms of sheer tonnage, outnumber fish and uh, you know things like that. All right, now diatoms are interesting. I mentioned the fact that if you look at the sand on the beach, that is mostly the skeletons of dead diatoms. The skeletons of diatoms are made of silica. Now, uh, early on, people noticed that if you take silica, it is very absorbent. It's extremely absorbent because it has a lot of, lot of little microscopic holes in it. And so uh, they used to take uh, silica from the beach and turn it into something called diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth, which is a very porous absorbent powder. Now, if you take diatomaceous earth and you sprinkle it all over cats and dogs, it will have the effect of killing fleas because it's a porous absorbent material that will suck the moisture out of the fleas. Right? So, uh, you know, but what the, the implications of that, of course, are that you say that the flea powder that you put onto your dog or cat is killing the fleas by drying out its eggs. It stands to reason, therefore, that flea powder is less effective if your dog and cat is always wet, and that's true. So the, the flea powder that you put on your dog and cat is non-toxic to the dog or cat. It doesn't hurt to swallow a little bit of diatom diatomaceous earth, but it dries out the eggs that the fleas are laying on the cat's fur, so that, that'll prevent the, that'll kill the fleas. Now, you know that dynamite, the word dynamite originally came from the word diatomaceous, and dynamite is where you take a highly explosive chem chemical called trinitrotoluene, and you absorb it into some diatomaceous earth that's formed into the shape of a stick. And so over the years, they changed the name. It, it was originally supposed to be TNT that was absorbed into a stick of diatomaceous earth, and then they just renamed it, uh, changed the spelling D-Y-N to dynamite. So here we have some beautiful diatoms. They're quite beautiful. And uh, if we look at a, uh, an electron microscope image, you can see that it looks like a box with a lid. It looks like a shoe box or something like that, some kind of a box with a loosely fitting lid. And the sand on the beach is made mostly of the skeletons of diatoms. If you melt down that sand, you can turn it into glass, and that's what the that's originally where they used to get glass from to make windows and bottles. 
And diatomaceous earth. Diatomaceous earth can be used for a number of things, including flea powder, which kills the fleas by dehydrating the eggs. Or you can soak up TNT into a stick of diatomaceous earth and you make dynamite. All right, let's move on and just mention the rhizaria. These are rhizaria, including radiolarins, and we're not going to discuss that, but these are other organ-dwelling, uh, organ uh, sorry, ocean-dwelling organisms, and they're quite pretty. They're kind of, they have radial symmetry, if you remember what that is from first-year biology. All right, let's look at the Archiplastida. A few of these are important to us. We're not going to discuss this because it's more the purview of ecologists, not microbiologists, but the arch Archiplastida are harmless photosynthetic algae, which originally gave rise to or evolved into the seaweeds, right? So all of these beautiful seaweeds that we have, we now believe that they originated, they evolved from the Archiplastida, the algae that are members of the supergroup Archiplastida. And that and the Archiplastida, these algae evolved eventually into the land plants. All right, the amoebozoa, we have to deal with these in some detail, right? So we have the slime molds, the gymnamoebas, and the entamoebas as super, uh, as subgroups of the supergroup amoebozoa. Okay, the th one thing they all have in common is that they all kind of roll around on a surface using a type of movement called amoeboid movement. And they put out pseudopodia, these kind of long, like they're stretching out their arms to grab bacteria, to drag them in and eat them. Those pseudopodia are made of actin microfilaments. We talked about actin microfilaments at the beginning. And they move through amoeboid movement. Now, it looks like they're rolling, but in fact, they're, it looks like they're rolling across a surface, but in fact, that's not what they're doing. They're actually using a very, very primitive, very, very inefficient method of moving. If you look at humans, we walk around and other animals run around. That's a very efficient way of moving. These things are a very primitive life form that, that has a very primitive form of movement, which is very energy expensive. And what it's doing is it looks like it's moving forward, because it's sending out a leading edge, what it's actually doing is it's putting together the front part of the amoeba and it's getting the materials to put together a new piece on the front by taking apart the backside, right? So it's putting together these new, uh, the leading edge that's moving forward is being built anew and it's being built from actin microfilaments and those actin microfilaments are you get them by taking apart, cannibalizing the actin microfilaments at the backside of the amoeba, which is quite, that's a pretty inefficient way to, to, to move, isn't it, right? If you, if you drove a car that way, that means you'd have to take apart the backside of the car and weld it onto the front and then cut it up and then take the backside and put it on the front again. So you're moving forward that way, very slow, very energy consuming. So here we see amoeboid movement, right? So here's the leading edge of the amoeba, which is actually being built by taking apart the actin microfilaments from the backside. And so the amoeba looks like it's rolling forward, but it's actually building the front, the front part again and over and over again. Okay, so I don't have a... Uh, I don't have a, 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 a video, but if you ever, if you, if you look on YouTube, you can find videos of, of amoeboid movement. It moves, it's able to do this taking apart the backside and building the front side quite quickly. And so these arms kind of reach out and extend and you can see the cytoplasm circulating inside and it's actually quite a, a beautiful thing to see. So you can look up some YouTube movies on your own and if you're interested and you can see amoeboid movement, it is quite fascinating to watch. All right, here we have a white blood cell, a human macrophage, which is enveloping a, a yeast cell. And the human white blood cells, the phagocytes that move around inside our blood vessels and inside our lymphatic vessels are moving using amoeboid movement. So we have cells in our own bodies that move using amoeboid movement. All right, so those are, the, those are some of the amoeba. Right. And then we also have to worry about the slime molds. And so there, there, uh, sorry, there are actually three general groups that we have to worry about. One of the subgroups is called the slime molds. 
and another subgroup is called the gymnebas, and there's another subgroup called the entamoebas. Okay, so the slime molds, as I mentioned earlier, they are harmless. They live in the soil, and they generally live individually, but when they're starving, they will come together to form a structure called the slime mold. So they are amoeba when they're not starving, and when they're starving, they come together to form a multicellular organism called a slime mold. Right. And so there are two types of slime molds. There, there are cellular slime molds and there are plasmodial slime molds. As I mentioned before, a cellular slime mold is where the whole mass of slime mold is made up of individual cells. And a plasmodial slime mold is where it's made of, uh, it, it is pla the plasmodial, the word plasmodial means a supercell, basically, where you have multiple nuclei with a common cytoplasm. Okay, then we're going to learn about the proper amoebas that do not form multicellular organisms, namely the members of the gymnamoebas and the entamoebas. So let's look at the slime, the slime molds first. Okay, so they, they live in the soil, and they live as independent amoeboids, unless they're starving or unless they're mating, in which case they form an aggregate life form. Right? Now, there's a difference between an aggregate life form and a multicellular organism. An aggregate organism just means that you put all these cells together and all of these cells are exactly the same, but they're not being controlled by any central nervous system or anything like that. They have very primitive ways of communicating with each other using chemicals that are absorbed through the cell or chemicals that are put out into the common cytoplasm but they are, they are an aggregate, sort of the same way that, a, that a, a, fun, a mold, a fungus, is composed of a bunch of individual cells that form an aggregate. Okay, so this is what it looks like. They, they wander around in the soil generally until they run out of food and then they come together, they form an aggregate. Then they, usually they wander around for a bit in, in looking like a slug. This is literally called the slug stage. So they, wa they wander around for a while, aimlessly, apparently, looking a lot like a slug or a worm crawling around. And then they sit in one place and they harden and they form a stalk. And atop the stalk is a case that contains a bunch of spores which bursts and then distributes more amoeba all over the place and then they go and do the same thing. Okay, we're going to learn about two different specific slime molds. One of them is a, the cellular slime mold that we're going to learn about is called Dictostelium discoidium. As I said, it's a very popular research organism, and that's why we it, it's often used by cell biologists to study cell division. That's one of the reasons why you need to know what it is, why you need to memorize that name. Right? And then a plasmodial slime mold, we're going to learn one example called Fuligoseptica, which is uh, endemic to British Columbia. Uh, you'll see it all over the forest, if you, uh, particularly in the fall. It's a detritivore, if you remember from your first year. A detritivore is something that breaks down the dead vegetable matter on the forest floor. It breaks down dead rotting leaves and eats, eats them. Okay, so here is this dic uh, discus. This Dictostelium discoidium, right? So it 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 uh, forms an aggregate under certain conditions. Then it forms a slug, the, the quote-unquote slug stage, and then it forms a plasmodium, a cellular slime mold, makes spores. The spores are distributed, and then they wander around a bit, and then they may form another aggregate. And the one thing that they all have in, that this has in common is that this is a cellular slime mold. So if you looked at the individual cells in the aggregate slug, for instance, you'd see that there are cell plasma membranes in between all of the nuclei. The nuclei are not just sitting in a great big giant common cytoplasm. This is an actual photograph of the aggregate coming together. This is the slug. The, the nuclei are stained here, so you can see how small the nuclei are based on the size of the nuclei. You know that nuclei are typically two or three uh, microns in diameter, so you can tell how long this is. It's not terribly long, not terribly big. You, you generally can't see it with, with the naked eye. You could probably see it with a dissecting microscope. You could certainly see it with a compound microscope. Okay, so here's the stalk that's forming, right? So up here we have a little container that's filled with spores. When that container bursts, it will distribute spores all over the forest floor, and then we'll have more of these amoeba wandering around. 
this is what it actually looks like. So you can see here, up here and up here is where you have the slime mold. And this is a twig. And so these are leaves that we're looking at. You can see the veins in the leaves. So you can see how, how small the, uh, the cellular slime mold actually is. You can see how small the discoidium dictostelium colony actually is. Fuligoseptica, example of a plasmodial slime mold where all the nuclei are together and they have a common cytoplasm. And so here's the diagram again. They wander around individually. Eventually, if they're starving, they'll form an aggregate, and then they'll form they'll they'll there'll be some mating, and then they'll form spores that are dispersed. This this cycle where they have a feeding plasmodium is referred to as plasmogamy. So plasmogamy refers to a plasmodial slime mold where you have multiple nuclei within a common cytoplasm. This is what it looks like. You can see there are twigs and you can see some grass and moss on the ground. So you will see this occasionally. If you, if you wander through the forest and you look very closely at the ground, you will see these things some of the time. All right, let's, let us move on to the proper amoeba. These are all members of the, of the supergroup amoebazoa. But these are, some of these, are, these ones that we're going to talk about here are dangerous. Right, so that there is a um, uh, two two members two uh, two members of the supergroup Amoebozoa uh, that we're interested in are number one the genus Entamoeba, which is an it's an anaerobic water amoeba. It lives in the water and it is parasitic to humans and it causes amoebic dysentery, which is of course violent bloody diarrhea, which you can track through the oral fecal route when you ingest water containing cysts. Okay, uh, genus Nigleria, example, Nigleria fowleri, is also known as brain-eating amoeba. It enters the body through the nose if you swim in contaminated water. Uh, it causes something called primary amoebic meningoencephalitis, or PAM, primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. I will probably ask you that at some point on a multiple choice question. Uh, and so... When you see bodies of water that have no swimming signs, they're generally warning you about Nigleria fowleri. Um, we don't have it in too many bodies of water in Canada because it generally doesn't live this far north. It's kind of a tropical organism. Um, the fact that Canada and other Canada and a lot of places in the in the northern hemisphere freeze in the winter is an advantage because a lot of a lot of the uh, microorganisms that make us sick will die during the freezing weather, right? So the, and then we're just left with a few uh, that are generally not not uh, toxic or pathogenic. Okay, so looking at amoeba, Entamoeba histolytica causes amoebic dysentery. So you ingest the cysts by drinking contaminated water, and it eventually ends up in your intestine causing severe diarrhea, even bloody diarrhea. Uh, the most common cause is sewage contamination of water. So you have a body of water that people are used for drinking, and it is contaminated with a small amount of sewage, possibly because sewage pipes are emptying out into that body of water. That's a common mistake that's made by people all over the world. It's a cheap, uh, you know, if you have, generally, if you have very poor countries, sometimes it's the cheapest way to get drinking water is to drink it from a river or a lake, and the cheapest way to get rid of the sewage is to send it back into the same lake and then hope that it gets dispersed enough that it will not cause any problems. Uh, you probably will have learned by now that um, another common place where you get dysentery and this kind of uh, sewage contamination of water is in refugee camps. Uh, where the, where the, you know, where does the water come from and where does the sewage go is a little bit of a tough question because the refugee camps are built as a temporary basis and uh, you know people are carrying things around in but carrying water and sewage around in buckets and so on so uh, camps uh, and and slums are particularly bad for having sewage contaminated water which is quite unfortunate um, another thing that's interesting is that a lot of a, some of these organisms will actually survive freezing I mentioned that Canada escapes having a lot of bad organisms because we it because the, we have freezing weather in the wintertime. But at the same time, we escape things like 
amoebic dysentery because the the you know we we're a wealthy country that that can afford to make sure that the sewage pipes and the water pipes drinking water pipes are well separated and well protected occasionally if you have an earthquake or something like that water pipes and sewage pipes will burst and then you can't trust the water supply to drink and that's why uh, we do have earthquakes occasionally in Vancouver so you should have an emergency kit which includes tablets that sanitize the water in case the sewage contaminates the water after an earthquake that does happen sometimes uh, but it is the most common cause now I mentioned the fact that uh, some of these cysts, uh, amoebic cysts, can survive being frozen sometimes. And so you go to some places in the world where you know that there is amoeba, amoebic dysentery in the drinking water, and they tell you don't drink the water, only drink bottled water or uh, you know something else, Coca-Cola or whatever. But if you put ice in your drink, they often you go to these resorts and things, they make ice cubes, and they often they don't filter the water to make the ice cubes. They, they advertise the fact that they filter the drinking water and they filter the water that they cook with in the kitchen, but they may not be filtering the ice cube water and so you have to be careful about that. So many times people get amoebic dysentery from contaminated ice cubes, okay? So one of the easiest ways to get rid of uh, amoebic dysentery is simply to filter the water. The the larger the cell is, the easier it is to get rid of it. It just so happens that amoebic cells are quite large. They can be 100 microns or even larger, which means that you don't need a very expensive, very sophisticated filter to get rid of them. Viruses are very small, and you, it is literally impossible to filter them out because they're so small. Bacteria are pretty small, so if you want to filter bacteria out of drinking water, for instance, you need a fairly expensive filter that has very small pores in it. The pores are actually put in it by radiation. But if you want to filter amoeba out of the water, it's relatively simple. And if you, in fact, if you want to filter any of these protists out of the water, it's relatively simple. So uh, protists cause a lot of problems around the world. One of the, the ones that are ca carried in a drinking water vehicle can be dealt with somewhat easily by filtering the water. Amoebic dysentery causes uh, um, uh, dysentery, bloody diarrhea. And the easiest way to get rid of it is simply to have a water filter. And so uh, various organizations, uh, generally people who get amoebic dysentery in very poor countries get it because they, they can't afford the filter, even though the filter is relatively inexpensive by our standards. But uh, there are various organizations, charitable organizations, that donate, provide filters for villages and, and people to filter the water so they, so they don't have to suffer from these, uh, from these diseases. Moving on to Nigleria fowleri, the brain-eating amoeba. If you see no swimming, it's often because the water is contaminated with Nigleria fowleri. Uh, as I said, uh, the Nigleria fowleri tends to die out uh, north of the 49th parallel, and that's where Canada is. So there, we don't have to worry too much about this in Canada. You do have to worry about it in certain bodies of water in the United States, for instance, and you definitely have to worry about it in the tropics. You have to worry about it in the tropical areas. So it gets into the brain through the nose, usually from the olfactory bulb, which is used for smelling things, right? And then you have the Nigleria fowleri. They have a swimming form. They have some flagella as well as the ability to crawl around the way amoeba do, and they cause encephalitis. Okay, this is a world map showing the distribution of Nigleria fowleri, and you can see that South Asia and uh, Asia and South Asia, as well as Australia, certain parts of Africa, certain parts of South America, and the United States and Mexico all have Nigleria fowleri are endemic to those areas. Okay. Finally, just mentioning that the Opisthocontas are the supergroup that eventually evolved into the fungi and the animals, which includes the humans. So the Opisthoconta are a supergroup of protists that we believe actually we evolved from a long time ago. All right, so we're not going to talk about humans or fungi or helmets because we're going to talk about those in future lectures. 
All right, now just to give you an idea, I've sent you to the World Health Organization page a couple of times by now, and I will be sending you to other public health websites and so on. And so you have an idea of how dangerous these things can be. Now, notice the number of infections in the world every year from protozoa like malaria and, so, and amoeba, toxoplasma, trypanosoma are listed here the number of infections. So you can see that quite a number of people are infected by malaria every year, 800, uh, 800 million. Right? 480 million people getting dysentery every year, something like that. Right? 24 million people getting trypanosoma infections. Right? And then getting infected and get, actually getting sick are two different things and so there, there's a slightly lower there are lower numbers for the diseases and then there are lower numbers still for deaths right so th this is the uh, so this is the mor uh, mortality rate which is what's being referred to here and so you can see that this is not trivial there are you know uh, there, there are millions of people who are dying from these protozoa diseases. Protozo these are protozoan diseases. And then in the category below that, you can see nematode diseases are quite significant as well. In fact, more people are infected by nematodes than infected by protists. Uh, nematodes are one of the helmets, trematodes and cestodes. In fact, these three categories at the bottom are all helmets, right? So nematodes, trematodes, and cestodes are all worms, worm infections. Right. Now you can see that they are not trivial either. There are a lot of deaths, a lot of infections from those organisms as well. Okay, so you might ask, why aren't there more drugs to treat these illnesses? And the reason is because there's no profit margin in these in drugs for this, because uh, these diseases are the people who suffer from these diseases generally live in in underdeveloped countries or poor countries and so even if the pharmaceutical industry invented drugs to treat these illnesses they couldn't afford to buy them right so that's a sad reality about commerce right now there's i i happen to think there's nothing particularly wrong with that my 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 personal view is that there's nothing particularly wrong with that uh, you can't blame companies for not wanting to do things that there is no profit in because they're owned by regular people as shareholders. And uh, they're, they're, the only reason they're in business is to make money. That's a universal truth. However, I think that, you know, so we can't scold the pharmaceutical companies for that necessarily. But what we can do is we can say that as a society, we should tax all of the people that make money, including all of us, and then we should take that money and use it to develop drugs and treatments for these diseases. So we can't say, we can't blame the pharmaceutical companies for not doing something that's not, that they're not, that they were never intended to do. You know, companies are only there for the purpose of making a profit, which is fine. But I think that obviously as human beings, we want to see these diseases and the millions of people who die from these diseases should be, uh, cured for humanitarian reasons. So what we do is, my, my philosophy is we let people make money as, as best they can, and then we tax that money and take some of it to do humanitarian things. And so uh, that is kind of what we're doing through the World Health Organization, and we're doing that through other charitable organizations, but charitable organizations are kind of a cop-out because I think, you know, uh, it's wonderful for people to donate money to charity, but if you just rely on donations, you never have enough money to actually do what needs to be done. And so I think a lot of these public health issues should be solved using tax money. And specifically, they should be solved using much more tax money than we're using now. Uh, just as an example off the top of my head, think about this. The pandemic in, 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 uh, in the United States, the pandemic... Uh, has forced people to, the COVID-19 pandemic has forced people to stay home. And in order to, if people are stay home, they can't work, they can't make any money, and so they'll, they'll starve, they'll go broke. And so the United States government and the Canadian government, for instance, have just both passed bills giving money to people who have to stay home. Uh, the Canadian bill was something like uh, something like 800 billion or something like that, giving money to people who are put out of a job by the COVID-19 pandemic. In the United States, it was it was a, about a trillion dollars, as I recall. Right, so a trillion dollars is is a huge amount of money. 
right? And that could have been avoided if instead of spending a trillion dollars to, to, to compensate people who were put out of work by the pandemic, why not just spend 100 billion on vaccine research before the pandemic became an issue? Uh, there was a lot. There was some small amount of money being spent on developing a vaccine for coronaviruses that are less lethal than COVID-19 in 10 or 15 years ago, but the, the the politicians didn't allocate enough money to do a good job for that. But you know, if they did, if if the United States spent 100 billion dollars on vaccine and disease research, and the Canadian government spent 10 billion dollars, all of these countries spent money that was proportional to their economy. We wouldn't have to spend huge or very huge amounts of money to to deal with the economic crises that are created by pandemics, right? So. It makes perfect sense. It makes good public policy sense to spend money at the beginning so that you don't have to spend a small amount of money at the beginning so you don't have to spend a huge amount of money later to clean up a mess that you should have prevented in the first place. All right, so that's my opinion about world uh, world health problems. And so at the moment, these uh, protozoa diseases specifically affect or selectively affect poor countries and there are no cures for many of these diseases because the pharmaceutical companies are not interested in doing research in those things because there's no money in it. However, there are some small amounts of money, not enough in my opinion, but there are some small amounts of money that are available through the World Health Organization and through uh, some other uh, organization, international organizations. I should mention, so there are some uh, there are some grants that are given to universities to do research on what are what are referred to as neglected diseases. Neglected meaning that these are diseases that only affect poor countries and the wealthy countries don't don't uh, do any research because the pharmaceutical companies know the poor countries couldn't afford to pay for the medication anyway. So. There are research grants that are handed out by the World Health Organization to researchers to do research on leishmaniasis and trypanosomes, for instance. And so there is research going on around the world that is funded by the World Health Organization to find diseases or cures to these neglected diseases. In addition to that, the United States, through the Food and Drug Administration, gives some grant money through a program called the Orphan Drug Act of 1983. It's money given to do research to find cures to diseases that only affect a few people, uh, and therefore there's no profit in it for the pharmaceutical company. You know, generally ph pharmaceutical companies will only do research to find drugs and medications and cures to diseases and problems that affect a large number of people. That way, they can make more money. Um, whether or not that constitutes greed or not, I will leave, I'll leave that to you to decide, but that's the way it works. And uh, so we do have some other avenues. In my opinion, they're not big enough, right? I think the, the, the uh, World Health Organization budget for doing research into neglected diseases could easily be 10 times bigger than it is and should be probably. All right, so just to summarize, we learned about five different supergroups of protists that are placed in between the domains and the kingdoms and the phyla. The supergroups are the excavata, the chromalveolata, the rhizaria, the archiplastida, and the amoebozoa. And then we learned about subgroups within them, such as the fornicata, the parabasalids, and the euglenozoans. We learned specific examples of each, and we learned the diseases that they cause. And those things could all be on multiple choice tests in the next few weeks. So good luck studying, and in the next lecture, I believe we're discussing helmets or fungi, I forget. We'll know when we get there. Thank you very much.